Welcome to Book Reporter Talks 2, where my guest today is Lisa Unger. I have been a long time fan of her work since Beautiful Lies, which I believe was her debut back in 2006. Is that possible? It's, it's possible that it was 2006, which is like a million years ago or 14, <laughs> 14 years ago. <laughs> Math it's, on command. Yeah, it was uh, my first Lisa Unger book. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. And so today we're going to be talking about Confessions on the 745, which was definitely one of the trippiest books that I've read in a while, as far as I didn't see what was coming. And sometimes I start to figure things out, but not this time. So welcome, Lisa. It's so great to see you because it's, it doesn't feel like it's been 14 years since Beautiful Lies. I still remember you, I remember that book coming into the office and I remember you coming in to meet me way back then. <laughs> I, I remember that too, and, and we're and we're both we both look so much younger than even we did then, we right? I mean, it's amazing! Things. Wow, we're only we're only getting younger, Carol. We're only getting younger. I'm still 27, even though I, my son yeah. is 30. You know, yeah. I know you look it. You look 27. And, and your daughter's now in high school, which I think she was like a, an infant when we first. Yeah, met, I think she know? was probably in. You know, she was probably in the stroller at that at that time. Yeah, exactly. when you first met her, for sure. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. she's grown up. You've written just a few books in between. You know, mm -hmm. it's not been anything big. So let's start out with you <laughs> telling us a bit about Confessions on the 745. Um, yeah. So at the beginning of Confessions, we meet Selena Murphy and she's a young mom and she's had a really bad day, like a terrible, awful day. And so, of course, as soon as she gets on her commuter train home, it stalls. It dies on the tracks. And sitting next to her is a beautiful stranger who strikes up a conversation with a confession. And I don't know, maybe it's the dark of the train or maybe it's the drink she shouldn't have had or maybe it's this awful day. But this confession leads Selena to share a dark secret of her own. And then the train comes back to life and Selena's headed back into her world. And she thinks, oh my God, why? why did I do that? Why did I share this dark thing about myself with this total stranger? And she hopes that she is never going to see the stranger from the train ever again. But of course, she will. And that's the setup for Confessions. And that is the complete setup. And, you know, I am one of these people who, well, if you work like a maniac when I'm on a plane, either that or I do chat to the person next to me. Yeah. And sometimes you chat to the person next to you. Yeah. And you start talking and you start telling them all these things and you get off and then you rip both a baggage claim and you look at each other and you like know way too much about this person. Do you know what I mean? You know that moment? I do. And I'm always sort of interested. I've always been, I mean, obviously the book is sort of loosely based on the idea of, stra of uh, Strangers on a Train with the Patricia Highsmith novel. But you have always been really super interested in that moment, you know, where two people who prior to that moment, you never met complete strangers to each other. And you're in this like liminal space, like the space between things like in a cab or on a train or in an airport. And you're, you're not quite the person you are where you left the other place and not quite the person you're gonna be when you get to the place that you're going. So you're both in this place and everything in her life and everything in your life led you both to be in that moment at the same time. And to me, it seems like there was like an energy to that, like a friction mm -hmm. to that. And I, I like to, you know, that was one of the things I wanted to kind of explore in this book. Yeah. And it's funny because sometimes you're watching two people on the plane and then you realize later on they don't know each other at all, but right. they've had this whole huge yeah. conversations going back and forth. I remember one time, because you know I knit a lot, I was knitting on the plane and the flight attendant came down and said, I remember you, you went to Tucson a couple of weeks ago. And I was like, really? And she says, yes, I remember you were sitting and knitting. And she says, I'm on this, you know, knitting site. And it was just the weirdest thing. I'm having this conversation with the flight attendant, but then she's bringing me free drinks. She's bringing me extra of right. like, you know, the, the pretzels or whatever it was. I was like, this is very funny. Yeah. But I don't know this person at all, but she's the flight attendant on the flight. Yeah. And, and there's a connection. I mean, there is, there's like a moment, there's a connection and it may not be a connection that leads to something else, but the, in that moment, it's intense and it's real. And I always sort of, you know, also for those moments too, like I always think like, you know, I don't necessarily believe in coincidence. I believe that everybody you meet for no matter how long 
there's a reason for it and that every person in your life, you know, even just these random encounters can sometimes be a lesson or something that you sort of need to um, get from the universe. So I do kind of believe that. And I also believe that, you know, no matter where a story began, you know, in a novel, it always began long before. Mm -hmm. There's always another story that was untold mm -hmm. before the story began. And so that's another thing I like to explore. And actually in all my books, there's always, there's usually a multiple, multiple timelines. Yeah, definitely multiple timelines. And, but every story starts with the kernel of an idea. I mean, every book starts with something. What was the kernel that sparked this one? What was happened? So there was an idea that I had kicking around my head for a while and I'm not even sure where it came from or where I heard it, but it was the idea that you can't con an honest man. And I thought, well, that it has the ring of truth to it, but it's too simple. It's too simplistic. Nothing about human nature is ever simple and nothing's ever like sort of black and white like that. And I had been thinking about it and I actually wanted to bring it, this years ago, brought it up on a panel um, like in the green room before a panel and one of my author friends, uh, Megan, Megan Abbott, she was there. She said, I don't know. She's like, that sounds like victim blaming to me. And I was like, that's true. It, it is a little bit like blaming the victim for being conned. And so that led me to sort of thinking about not just the psychology of the con artist. It had me thinking about the psychology of the person who falls for a con. Mm -hmm. So this got me doing some research into this, and I found this book called The Confidence Game by Maria Konnikova, and it's a really super um, riveting book about, you know, the psychology of the con artist, the psychology of the person who gets scammed, and the big takeaway from that book was that most people think that they're vulnerable are invulnerable to, um, you know, to the confidence game or the scam. Most people think, oh, I'm way too smart. That can never happen to me. But in fact, everybody is incredibly vulnerable. And the more you think you're not vulnerable, the more vulnerable you actually are. And so I came away from that book thinking, well, maybe not that you can't con an honest man. It's that you can't con somebody who doesn't want something. Mm -hmm. We all want something. And the con artist is very, very good at seeing what that is and knowing what that is, maybe before you even know it yourself. And so that was sort of the germ, that was the seed, the idea, the energy. And then from that point, I started hearing the voice of Pearl and then later Selena. And that was, um, and those were the voices that I followed through the narrative. Yeah, it's, it, they're both very, very powerful voices as well. Now the plotting in this is completely masterful. Do you plot in advance? Like, do you lay it all out or? No, no. Do you do this on the fly? Because oh, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> on the fly? I don't know so much. It takes me a year to write a book. <laughs> so I don't know how much flying on the flying we're doing. But I, um, you know, I, when I, so I have these voices and then I, I do really follow them through the narrative. And when I sit down to write, I don't really know what the book is about. I don't know who's going to show up day to day or what they're going to do. And I definitely don't know how the book is going to end. I feel like if I did, I wouldn't be able to write it. So I know there's this always this kind of this conversation about, you know, it's, it's always like plotters versus pantsers. And that's the, <laughs> that's the word that people use for it. But I don't think that's really true to the process. I think George R. R. Martin talks about um, gardeners. You know, mm -hmm. the seed gets planted and the cre creativity is an organic process and that you're present for this story to unfold. Um, and that it's, I think at the end of the day, it's not so different. It's just one is shorter and one is longer, right? You might have that plot constructed in like a, like a scaffolding, like that's how some writers work. But for others, it takes longer. We need to build sort of from the ground up. And that's kind of how, that's kind of how I see it. So more of a, as like a gardener than as a, um, pan you're not a pantser. No, I you're a like gardener. You're because sewing like, and the things are coming up. <laughs> yeah. Cause it kind of implies that you don't know what you're doing. Mm -mm. And, and I've been writing, you know, since I was a kid and I've written 18 novels and I, and I have a craft that I've like d basically dedicated my life to, to honing. And so I do actually know what I'm doing. It's not just like I, sh out of sheer luck or accident, happened to write 18 novels. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like, it's, 
Just say <laughs> number 16, it was like, oh, this is how I do it. No, this is how I've done it all along. <laughs> oh, right. This is how. Yeah. <laughs> there are no new miracles. No new miracles happening. This no, is no. It's just, you know, it's inspiration initially. And then it's, you know, it's uh, blood, sweat, and tears like anything else you want to do well. Well, you know, there's so many great lines. You write tension really well. And you write tension in these really interesting ways. There's this moment where Selena's phone is dying and her thoughts are pivoting around. And we've all had that moment where the phone is dying and you're in the wrong place. And you get in her head like immediately because she's like, phone is dying. What am I going to do? Can I plug it in? What's going to happen? And she's shooting these heads all around. Now, when you're writing something like that, does it always come in with that level of tension or do you start writing and then ramp it up? Because I felt like I was in the room with that woman and I felt like, okay, that phone has got to get plugged in somehow. <laughs> we all know the urgency of feeling like our phone has to get plugged in. I mean, this is something we all, we all know very well. God forbid we should go even one minute without the thing, right? And mine usually gets case, to, she really does need it, you know? <laughs> mine usually gets to like 5%. Right. And then I'm like, oh, that's what I've been ignoring for the last two hours, you know? Right, yeah. right, exactly. She needs yeah. the phone. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I feel like, I mean, I'm very much inside my, I'm very much inside the work. You know, it's very much so um, a, um, you know, a inside out writing experience. I'm not on the outside mm -hmm. looking down on my plot or looking, in, I'm in it looking out. And so I feel like for, you know, I feel like as long as I'm feeling that tension, that involvement with character, um, you know, just that kind of in the head of a character who's like, you know, your phone is dying and you, and you need it, you know, like in some kind of really urgent way. I think we can all sort of empathize with that moment, knowing that, okay, if I plug it in here and I have to go there, then how am I going to get back for it and all that? It's like, that's very organic to me, like to, to kind of get into that headspace. And it's not so much like, I'm never sitting outside thinking, how do I create tension? Mm -hmm. Right. Like that's never, that's never the kind of thought that I'm having when I'm writing. I'm, I'm in the, I'm in it already. So I'm already feeling that tension and hopefully communicating it. Well, you know, at one point, one of the characters, I won't even use name is reflecting on social media. And there's this line, this totally segues into this, that where people were so wrapped up in their own inner hurricane that they never saw anything outside the storm of themselves, mm -hmm. which is such a really great line. And did anything special make you bring that one out? Because it's truly what it's like. It's you're wrapped up in yourself. You don't see anything around you. Yeah, I think that, you know, so, so social media and technology is something that has kind of come to the forefront in um, my recent work because it's something that I think about a lot. Um, I think about how, you know, there's just this way now that we're like sort of living our lives in this, this it's like almost like a broadcasted version of ourselves. And it's like, you know, every moment is curated and filtered and put out there for consumption. But that the truth is that our real lives are being lived when we're not posting mm -hmm. on social media. You know, that is, the, that is the stuff of real life. And there are so many layers. And I think that it's easy for people to hide behind that veneer and to project a perfect image of themselves and not share the other stuff that's going on, which I think is, you know, I think is injurious in a lot of ways for ourselves mm -hmm. and for the people in our, in our circle and our lives and our communities and all that, like nobody, you know, nobody feels, you know, um, able to share like in Selena, like, you know, that's one of her big challenges is that she's got this Instagrammable life. She's like the perfect couple, the perfect mom. She's like, even her life is like, is, is, is falling to pieces and she's posting, you know, curated pictures of herself and her family, like on their afternoon walk, Sunday walk. And, you know, so that's something that I really, really do think about. I also think it feeds this kind of, you know, this kind of narcissistic storm, like a cultural storm where you're always thinking about yourself and how you're going to present and how you're going to post. And, you know, it's so difficult for people to be present in the moment anyway, and all these devices and social media just make it even more so. So, I mean, of course, this is the perfect thing for anybody who wants to disappear, anybody who wants to run a con, you know, people are not even looking out anymore. They're just always looking down at that device in their hands. And it's definitely something that's come up multiple times in the, especially in the last few books as it's been like something that's very, 
you know, I spend a lot of time thinking about and observing. Well, you know, I have a couple of friends who are not on any social media and yeah. I think about, do they have more time in their day? I mean, look, I follow a lot of authors. I follow a lot of people in publishing. There's a lot of times I'll find out about a book. I mean, I'll be, you know, I say, oh, such and such is out next week, or you'll hear somebody talking about it. And I think about it, if I didn't have that part of my life, what would I be missing? Like that, it's like, you know, the, the FOMO, the fear of missing out right now. Yeah. You're not missing out on going many places, but you're missing out on what story would I not see? Like there was a piece the other day in the Wall Street Journal about somebody I used to work with, it's an yeah. obituary. And I would have not wanted to miss that obituary in the Wall Street Journal, yet someone uh, who I used to work with posted it. And I'm like, would I have seen that? Would I have? So there are those moments where it's that push-pull kind of thing. It's great things about it. And then there's the other side. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of great things about technology. I mean, certainly there are things that have really, you know, sort of made our lives a lot easier. Like, just think about, you know, like the navigation app, right? Like how you get from, I mean, I don't even know if I can find my way to the grocery store anymore at this point. Like, maybe it's not a good thing, but it's like the, there are certain things that are about it that are really important. And then I think within our industry, you know, uh, in, you know, uh, authors and publishers and editors, agents, you know, media people, like this is a way in which we, this is our, there is a real sense of community online. Mm -hmm. And so it does, um, it does have value and it does have function, especially for somebody who is, you know, working in that, in that medium, right? Um, but I think that the, I think that the shift that could take place is that we approach it with intentionality. Mm -hmm. That when we go on, to the social media, um, social networks, and we go on to the news and we go on to the, you know, all the various things that are going on in the world, that we go on there with intention and then we step away from it and step back into our lives in an intentional way, that we don't lose hours, like sort of, I, I call it doom scrolling, mm -hmm. you know, especially yeah. in the news, like how much worse is it gonna get? A lot, a lot worse. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, that's like one of my big things about social media, like do not scroll because that's the way to go down the rabbit hole and just wind up someplace where you didn't even know you could lose two hours. And um, I think that that is really the shift that um, is important for everybody in the industry and outside the industry that, you know, we approach it with intentionality. We use it for what it's, what it's used for. We do our due diligence, certainly for authors, you know, there's an idea that, um, we should be promoting and be out there and doing our thing. And certainly there are more opportunities to do that than ever. But I think that if we can approach it with intentionality and remember that, you know, as writers, all the important work happens on the page. Mm -hmm. Never stop exactly. thinking about the writing. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever came to your work because you were a great publicist. Mm -hmm. They came to your work and stayed because you gave them a great story. You gave them characters that stayed with them. You transported them for a while. So a vast majority of your energy has to be spent. And mine is on getting better every time. Every mm -hmm. day, I think I can be a better writer than I was mm -hmm. yesterday. And your work, I mean, I love Beautiful Eyes years ago, but you know, just to see how much more complex, I will say that's the word I'm going to use, complex, your writing has gotten as time has gone on. You know, there's a lot in here about Selena as a mom, and she's got this reckoning that I really love that she has about 28 minutes a day where she's just herself. The rest of the day, she belongs to someone else. And she's having a moment of reckoning about her life. She has a successful career. She's a wife, a mother, but she's questioning who she is and comparing herself among other people. And she's constantly looking at that thread up against um, other people. And I think that this, there's something that women go through, especially at, I want to say when they're in their 40s and 50s, you do it really more. I have this line that in the 40s, everybody gets honest. Till then, you have the best boyfriend, the best husband, the best, you know, house, the best this. And all of a sudden, you sit there and go, things are rockier than they plan, and you can be honest. Mm -hmm. And I think that mm -hmm. she's having that moment of being yeah. honest. Yeah, yeah, she definitely is. You know, I think that, and I, and I think that that's part of her evolution as a character in the book. Like, she starts off, I mean, she starts off as one thing, and by the end of the book, she's, some, she's something else. She's somebody else. And, you know, that's always the journey that you kind of hope for for, for your characters. In, in a novel. And she's definitely having that moment where, 
you know, and I agree, I completely agree with you. I mean, that's so true. You know, like there is a moment in your life where you're like, okay, you know what? It's not, it's not perfect. And PS, you're not perfect either. And we don't have to anymore pretend that anybody is perfect, that we can just, you know, kind of band together and help each other through this, you know, morass of working and marriage and kids and, you know, the dog throwing up at 4 a.m. and like, you know, the whole domestic craziness that most of most working moms in the middle of it are dealing with like kind of every day you know this like real you know um this real like sort of chaotic mix of like you know good bad and ugly and everything else in in between right so i think she's definitely very much so in that moment and again you know for her it's about those those liminal spaces Mm -hmm. you know it's like the spaces in between the other things and she's starting to like you know she's counting those those minutes as you say like there's 28 minutes of selena this is the only place where i am not your mom or your wife or this worker bee or whatever and i think i mean i can't imagine any you know working mom not knowing what that means or what that feels like and also knowing exactly what it feels like when you're going to get the 745 instead of the earlier train and what that's going right. to mean to the whole right. day. To the whole routine, like the, the nighttime routine is shot. It's done. You're. <laughs> it's like we used to walk out of the office when we went to the office at six o'clock and it'd be raining. And I'm just there like another half hour to this commute. Like, you know, you're walking yeah. into a nightmare and you're just there like right. now. And it's just, you have this rhythm of what you think is going to happen that night. And then all of a sudden you're stuck on the train and you're, so you're immediately out of sorts with her. Like right at the beginning of the book, you're like, oh, her day is off. Oh God, the train's delayed. The kids need their story. You know, other things that we won't even get into have happened. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. lots of other stuff happened. Bigger things, bigger things have happened. (laughs) Well, which brings us to this other great few lines of, Lies are like a virus. They spread and replicate. One lie breeds another. And I think that there are so many lies in this book. There's so much of who's telling what, who's telling what about themselves. And you do a good job of sprinkling in that you're not really sure what the truth is. Like as I was going through, it's like, wait, who's telling the truth? Is she lying? What's going on? And what fun is that to sit there and set up the lies? You know, because I know you didn't lie as a child. I mean, you didn't lie as a girl. No, this is I'm like you're lying. Perfect. I was always so perfect. It's I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I um yeah, I'm always I'm always very interested in lying. Um I I re- I read a book um a, a while back by a guy named Joe Navarro who was a um, a, uh, for, he's a former FBI interrogator and he wrote a book called what everybody is saying. And he writes about, um, the limbic responses of the brain when somebody is lying or when they're uncomfortable and how it manifests itself in the body, what he is looking for in, you know, the body of people that he is interrogating. It's not so much that like, you can tell somebody's lying because they looked up into the right or whatever. There's like, it's not so simplistic as that, but it is like, you know, all these things that people do with their bodies when they're uncomfortable and you just have to figure out what it is that's making them uncomfortable and they can't control it. Um, And so that was like, and so that was one, that's something that, you know, the stuff I read in that book is some of the stuff that kicks around. And then there's another book that I read more recently called Lie Spotting, by a woman named Pamela Meyer. She talks about not just like the tells of the body and what people do when they're lying. She talks about why people lie. And her idea is that, you know, everybody lies all the time that you're just basically lying all day. And you lie, and and there's like a there's a million reasons why and how you lie to other people and to yourself. And so, and they're not all bad reasons. I mean, you just, you might lie just to, you know, smooth over a difficult encounter at the grocery store, or you might want not want to hurt your friend's feelings, or you might, you know, you know, your, your husband is feeling bad about something. And so you maybe embellish some compliment that you're giving him so that he feels better about himself. Like there's all million different ways that we, that we lie. And so that was something that I found really um, interesting as well. And it was like another thing that I explored in this book is that, you know, everybody has a lie. Mm -hmm. in this book and not a lie that they that they're telling themselves a lie that they have been told 
um, you know, they may be presenting a different um, uh, face to the world than exists beneath. Um, so they all have their different layers and reasons and um, just, you know, ideas about who they have to be, and what they need to project. Um, so that's very much so a theme of the book and something that I kind of unravel. It is because it's, it's like everybody's who's telling the lie, what is happening with the lie. I mean, a woman is dead, a young girl is missing and the man center is a ghost. I'm like, okay, there's three really good lines. Like, okay. well, there's always, there's always going to be some, there's always going to be a dead character. Always. There's always somebody dead. Always. always. There has to be. I mean, because there, nobody ever really dies. They're always with us. If they were important to us. They're always there. They're always there, but oh yeah. my gosh, what <laughs> happens with these people is yeah. just crazy. <laughs> There's another line in this book, speaking of that, where you reference traces of blood. Uh, Geneva's thought is you could never clean away all the traces of blood as she's wiping. The hemoglobin always stays behind. And I consider that, here we go for a pun, folks, a little red herring. So when she is doing that on the counter, there's this little red herring that is right up there up front in the book. We're not that far in. Do you always land those at the beginning or do you go back later on and go, let her scrub that yeah, counter now? You know, I, it's, it's interesting because of the way I write, you know, it is like really, and that's an interesting one specifically that you picked out because I, you know, I, I write from a very like organic place and it's almost like I, um, it's like my subconscious knows the story better than I know it. So that in some ways, like I'll find myself writing something and I'm not exactly sure why it's there, mm -hmm. but I know myself well enough to know that it needs to stay there because 50 pages down, I'm going to be like, Oh, right. That. <laughs> And Carol caught it. Right? And Carol, she's so smart. She's so smart. And that was actually one of them because I was like, why is there a spot of blood on the counter? What happened? Right. Like, so at that moment, like, I didn't even really know what had transpired between them mm -hmm. and what was, what was the outcome of what had transpired between them. But I, you know, it, you know, there's the robot and there's, you know, the... <laughs> There's the blood. And I was like, well, I guess we'll figure this out, you know, 50 pages from now. And that's usually, that's usually what happens. Well, so when I was reading, I folded that page down because I read, usually read an arc. I have a beautiful hard cover here, but I read the arc and I fold down all the pages because I don't know why they're there, but right. I'm just guessing they're there for a reason. And I come back later and I didn't reopen the book till this morning when I started to do these questions. And I was like, oh, why is that page folded down? Why is that one down? <laughs> I'm now putting it all together. You're putting it all together. There you go. Now there's this other one um, that I love this, that women are mysteries. And I love Pearl's line back, only men think that largely because they're not paying attention. <laughs> Such a great line. And I feel like that as well as not being paid uh, attention, I was being stumped again and again. But such a great line of like, well, they're women of mystery. No, we're not. You just didn't pay attention when we were talking. Right, there's no before. mystery here. It's, it's, it's really, it's all out there. You're just blind. You're willfully blind. Yeah. <laughs> We're I'm actually it all out. literally telling you what you need to do, what we want. You're just like willfully confused. <laughs> it's like, really, just follow the dots. You know, yeah. There's times where I'm all over the place when I'm talking. My husband goes, wait a second, I thought we were talking about this and now we're on that. And now we're back. He goes, how do we Keep get back to the other subject? I said, just follow along. I mean, come on. It's been 30 years. Keep right. Exactly. Right <laughs> At this point, if he's not following along, we're, you know, there's nothing you can do. Because we're over like fixing the dishwasher to like, what? Like Thanksgiving <laughs> and then back? And I was like, well, yeah, because if the dishwasher doesn't work perfectly for Thanksgiving, it's going to be a problem. And it's like, I mean, I would have been able to follow that. Obviously, <laughs> if the dishwasher is broken in October, it's going to take in a pandemic. <laughs> how many weeks is it going to take for you to replace or repair that dishwasher before Thanksgiving? I mean, come on. Well, we've been having these big discussions about you have to run the dishwasher every day now because there are three of us in the house. So there's, you'll run out of dishes. Like you'll yeah. run out of the, the bowls that I should just go buy more of, like seriously. <laughs> but instead we jam everything in the dishwasher. And the <laughs> head came down. I was like, oh my God, the dishwasher has not run again. I so know, I know. Everything in again, you know the feeling, you know? I do. Oh my God, I do. Yeah, for sure. And then emptying the dishwasher is like, Climbing the Himalayas or something like that. Like, oh, do I have to oh, the dishwasher. 
I mean, I, I have some people in this house add more dishes to the clean ones and run it again. And I'm like, really? Really? You can't do that. That is, that is a domestic crime. It is. Okay. That really is. That's a domestic crime for sure. So which was your favorite character to write? I'm going to guess, but I'm probably going to be wrong. It's guessing, Selena. Oh, gosh. I don't. I don't know if I could pick a favorite one. Everybody is very important to me, you know, and the time that I spent with them was very, you know, um, layered and interesting. And, you know, I have a lot of, compa a lot of compassion for each of my characters in this novel, even those that don't deserve, maybe don't really deserve it. Um, and, uh, and I, I, loved spending time with Selena, but, uh, you know, Pearl had so, so many, so many layers, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so many layers. And, um, it was very interesting to discover her layer by layer. Was she the trickiest one to write? Cause I was picking her as the trickiest one to write because there were so many layers. I don't know that I would call her tricky. It wasn't, you know, again, it's not like that space where, I'm not trying to create her and put her onto the page. So I'm not trying to wrangle her onto the page. I'm just listening. I'm just, I'm just watching. I'm letting her reveal herself to me on the page. So it's not so much that, you know, oh, how do I make her this thing? Like there's never any, any thought like that for me, like not ever. It's more like, oh, here she is, you know, what is she trying to say? and you know allowing that to evolve on the page so the more complicated a character is um the more interesting it is you know she or he is for me and even the you know even the darkness for me mm -hmm. is very interesting like why you know how were you formed and i you know when you pearl is like a good example because you know you can kind of see her like when you first see her she tells you um that her superpower is to be invisible, right? To be a watcher. Mm -hmm. So she's a, she's a, you know, she's a very, very um, keen observer of people and things. And this is a common, um, a common way that children of abuse and neglect grow up. They grow up watching because they have to know, they have to be able to predict, are my needs going to be met? How am I, and if they survive, you know, um, how, how am I going to get my needs met? Is this person going to react with rage if I say X? I, so you're always, you, children of abuse are always watching faces. Mm -hmm. And so I found that very interesting. And so she's developed, you know, she's a survivor. So she's developed these skills that have allowed her to survive, not only the abandonment of her father, but also, you know, the sort of neglect of Stella, her mother. Mm -hmm. Like it's not, a, not, not the worst mother, not, an, not a necessarily an abusive mother, but just very much in her own you know, hurricane of herself kind of a thing. And so, you know, Pearl doesn't have the same kind of, you know, attention that, that she needs. Mm -hmm. And so then I was interested in, in Charlie, how he um, must have seen that in her because mm -hmm. that's who he is. He's a predator. And so he's seen Stella and he's seen Pearl and the pair of them are very compelling to him because there's a, there's a fissure there that he can exploit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's having a relationship with Stella, but it's really Pearl that he's interested in. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm play so, to get that. What am I going to do to get that? But it's right. cunning. It's this kind of cunning kind of thing. Right. It's this like, and it's, and it's definitely not like, and it's all, it's all sort of pre-thought, you know, the stuff that happens with people. Like it's not, it's not strategy necessarily. It's just like a predator prey relationship. It's instinct. Mm -hmm. So that was very interesting um, for me to explore that and Selena in some ways is closer, closer to me, you know, closer to my life, like closer to the, the, the things that I, that I think. And so it's a very companionable space to be, to be with her, but you know, she didn't have as many layers as, as Pearl. Mm -hmm. And her danger isn't in every single layer of page of what's going on. Pearl right. was in danger a lot more. And right. she see it coming at some point and it's really interesting to right. see that she gets played she gets played as much as she yeah. thinks what she's doing she's getting played like every single angle so. yeah and she makes mistakes mm -hmm. which i also think is in, was, was interesting about her is that you know you usually when you see these types of characters on the page they you know they're very you know they're extra cunning super you know um 
super just, you know, on, on top of everything, you know, almost supernatural in their ability to plan and plot. And, and she, she makes like sort of pretty significant mistakes in, in some of her, in some of her scams and some of the, the, the things that she's running. And I, um, and, and I love, I liked that about her because it made me think, um, you know, maybe she's just not as into it as she, as she seems to be, you know, mm -hmm. usually when you make mistakes, there's, there's a reason, right? So maybe she's, you know, maybe, it, it, you know, she's accused, you know, at, at times, like your heart, your heart's not in it, your heart's not in this. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I was thinking about her when I was, when I was spending time with her. Yeah. You know, um, and maybe your heart's not in this. Maybe you want a normal life. life. Yeah, you want a normal life. You want a yeah. normal life, and you don't yeah. have a normal life at all. She never did. She never did. Mm -mm. Yeah. And she's still sort of looking at because she's like the trickiest one to me in a lot of ways. How about the cover? Well, first of all, was it always Confessions on the Seven Forty Five? Nope. No, <laughs> really, and it's such a perfect title. I know, um, and usually, you know, like I have a title for a book, and if I really like it, then it will mean that um, everybody else will hate it. That's usually how it goes. <laughs> and if I hate a title, then it's definitely going to be the title for the book. Like that's also just kind of how it goes. And so, um, my original title for this book was, uh, and I had just for I had totally forgotten what it was until yesterday. My original title was ba was Bad Girls. Oh, really? And um, I uh, and and then usually what happens is like if my editor hates the title or the the sales or marketing department doesn't like the title, then there's like a huge back and forth, lists and lists and lists of titles, and everybody's like, "What about these three? No, these three. What about these three? And then finally, it was, uh, we arrive at one that everybody's like, "Yes, that's it," and it's like happy. <laughs> Yay! Um, but this title, I have to say, uh, this title was all Erica, uh, my editor. She she conceived of this title, and when she said it, I was just like, "Oh my God, that's it! I mean, this is it! That's the perfect title!" So like, we both had that like sort of joy moment with the title, and it came pretty quickly. So that that's a good thing. And I like it because it's easy to remember. Because there are a lot of titles these days that are not that easy to remember. I like, know, like, I know. It's and so it's like Confessions on the Seven Forty Five, and I have talked to so many people about this book and it's one I and I sit there going no wait what was the title it's a new yeah. longer no it's confessions on the 745 because it's so is set up right at the beginning of what happens with these two people and it's that's what spews you know the whole book you know kind of spills from there yeah now how about the cover was that um a lot of time too or no that... this was the first cover um that that they showed me and it was just out the gate you know perfect I mean everything about it is perfect it's just it's um it's like, it's beautiful. It's yep. like, it's matte, but it's like sh letters are shiny. And the, um, you know, it's just kind of creepy. The figure in the window is very what? mysterious. Uh, yeah, it's just, a per I mean, it's, it's an absolutely gorgeous package. I mean, the people at Park Row are just, you know, stellar in, in every way possible. And um, yeah, I just absolutely love it. It's gorgeous. No, it's really good. And you know what? Also, when I finished reading it, it's a slim novel. It's not like over, some things are overwritten. This is not, there's not a spare word. I mean, it's like action, 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 yeah. little tiny pause, action, action, action. And oh my gosh, no, really, Siri, that was going to happen? Did yeah. not see that coming. So, <laughs> I love brisk it. Brisk writing. Like, oh, wait, I've got to get this down before dinner. Okay, fine. Yeah. <laughs> there we so go. I have to make dinner. Let me finish this chapter. Well, <laughs> working, working mom here, working mom here. Now, speaking of which, not what are you having for dinner tonight, but if you are in the middle of an idea, can you stop and come back to it the next day? Or, I mean, because I could be pretty impossible of, like, we're having dinner, because my husband's usually making dinner during the week, and he's like, it's ready, and I'm like, but, but one more thing. One, one, more, one more thing, thing, one more thing, one more thing. <laughs> are you one more thing, or are you, okay, I can turn this off and pick up tomorrow. Yeah, you know, I, you know, so I guess it's, it's partially because, you know, I've always written really super early in the morning, right? Like even when I was right, when I was working in publishing and, you know, I had to get up before work to, to write, you know, or I was writing on, on my commute, um, on the train or in spare moments. So I've always had that ability to write anywhere and to just kind of slip into that zone. Like there's no preciousness to me about where, or when, 
Like if I need to, if I need to get something down, if I need to get something down, I'll get it down. I could be in the car. I could be where, wherever. And, uh, but you know, very much so, you know, the rhythm of my creativity is like my golden creative hours are from 5 AM mm. until noon. Like that's my big creative block that, you know, um, the, the biggest part of my work is done during that time, which is not to say I don't write at other times or when I'm tor towards the end of the novel, it's like nonstop, like you can't stop writing kind of a thing. So that's kind of how that works. But, you know, it's very much so, you know, this, you know, if I have a thought, I may think about it, entertain it. And I always just feel like if it's not there, when I sit down in that creative space, then it wasn't really worth anything. Mm -hmm. You know, like I feel like most of those things that I have thought, like if I've, you know, if I've had like a 3 a.m. wake up, which happens quite a bit, and I did not get up and write, usually it's there when I get up at five or six and go to my desk. So it's like, you know, and almost like when you have a thought, I feel this like sense of like, okay, all right, great. I've got this piece or whatever it was that wasn't working. And then it's like, I'm excited to get back to that space. But I very much try to batch my creative time so that like, you know, it's, it's always there, you know, mm -hmm. like I, as ocean has gotten older, I have more time, but you know, I've always, since she's been born, I work during, I work around her schedule. So mm -hmm. right now her schedule is, you know, she starts class at 7.20 and she's done at one something at this point, you know, virtual learning. And so that's my biggest creative block because I know mm -hmm. that I have it. And if I need more time, I have that too. But if I, you know, if I need to be with her and I need to be a mom and I need to do, you know, take her here or there, do whatever in a normal circumstance, I'm on deck for her at that mm -hmm. time. So I, I definitely try to keep a hard compartmentalization between my my deep work my creative work the more shallow work of you know the business publishing and then you know my mom time family time time with you know uh, our time together I try to keep a very strict separation between those things because anything else is madness mm -hmm. anything mm -hmm. else is just chaos so and that's you know of course many years of <laughs> Trial and, <laughs> and exactly and it's a, you know it's a process you know <laughs> and you get 14 minutes to yourself it's and then 28 <laughs> minutes of lisa or whatever it is <laughs> well you know, it's funny because like, people because we've been home now people are saying oh i get up in the morning and work out so that i have that done for the day and i was like i work up and i start like doing stuff but yeah. i am the night owl i mean i can oh, click right. in at like you know that 1 a.m 3 a.m and there are many times when i'm just there like just go to sleep but yeah. that's where no one from the office is going to find me. There's nobody yes. else looking for me yes. and I can just churn through and do hours of work because yes. it's just that uninterrupted time. Yeah. And, and that's the other end of the spectrum for me. Like I'm on the other side. Like there's a, you know, when ocean was really small, I was up at four. Mm -hmm. You know, I would, and I tell this to aspiring writers all the time that there are two very special hours that nobody else on earth wants. And that's four to 6 AM. Yeah, nobody wants it you know, it's yours. <laughs> you, just, you have to give up sleeping, but it's there for you. And that those, those hours, you know, when Ocean was really little and, you know, it, during the times when I was working a full-time job as well as trying to write a novel, I, um, I really got, you know, those two hours where there's nothing else but you mm -hmm. and the story, I mean, there, there's no, no, there's no other, other place for that. And it might be for some people, it might be, you know, 12 to two mm -hmm. the kids mm -hmm. are asleep and you don't, you know, and you, and you're done for the day and all your responsibilities are done and you can allow yourself to be in that creative space. If you're a night owl, that's where you'd go. But for me, that's no. <laughs> But you know, it's interesting though, because I always have everything hanging over me all day. Whereas I feel like if I could be that morning four to six or seven to five to seven or whatever, right. it'd be great because everything you have to do is like then done and then you're available for everybody else. For me, it's like, oh, these are still lingering later. So it, it is yeah. hard to get into your space, to get in your head space about what to do. Yeah. And I get, I don't know that you can really choose it. Like, I don't know that you can choose to be um like a night owl or a morning person i think your circadian rhythm is pretty set mm -hmm. you know like i think it's a, i think it's pretty hardwired i mean you can try it 
Um, you can try to wake up from four to four to six. See how that goes. See how that works. Maybe you on the clock change. See a basket case by the, the week that the box. clocks change. I might be okay. Like, okay, yeah, because we have a little more sunlight. I mean, it's like pitch black until like seven fifteen right now. It's like, come on! I was like out the other day early for you know just to get that exercise in before the day got crazy, and I was like, it might as well be midnight. It's so <laughs> dark. Well, the other night, even at seven o'clock at night, it's dark here now. Yeah, yeah I know it's like, getting dark here too. Yeah. Remember when it was nine and we were still and sitting then, outside? It was nine fifteen, and now it's like seven o'clock, and it's like, oh, go to sleep. You know, this isn't going to work. You know. <laughs> Besides everything else that you do, you, you're very generous with other writers, speaking with them, and you have your own YouTube channel where you interview authors that are called Three Good Things. So, yeah. how did this come about, and how do you pick who's going to be on, and all those kinds of things? I love this. Oh yeah, so I am. Um, you know, I don't know, like the pandemic hit and I was literally traveling up until like the weekend before lockdown. Like I had, you know, I mean, I just wasn't getting the memo and I still had all of these engagements booked. And I was like, is anybody going to cancel these? And like, nobody did. And I was like, okay. So like literally like, you know, March 12th, I was at an event. There was like 300 people there. Wow. I mean, like, hugging, kissing, handshaking, the whole thing, like for, you know, um, for Where the entire day. Where were you? Where was I was that? at the Fort Myers Book Festival, which was, you know, a wonderful festival, you know, but I, I was thinking, is this going to get canceled? Nope. Show up there. I was like, well, you know, I'm not going to cancel. So like, go do my thing. And, you know, and then by that weekend, we were, you know, I guess maybe, maybe it was even the following weekend we were, we were on, you know, on lockdown and I was like, oh, Okay, and it's funny because I kind of think of myself as an extreme introvert. I mean, mm -hmm. I am. I am an extreme introvert, right? Like I need, I'm nourished by solitude. I, most writers are, right? But I also have this really big community of friends, mm -hmm. like people that I truly love and, you know, who I've been working with, like yourself, for a million years, like a bazillion years. And I was like, so I'm an introvert, but I'm not like a hermit, right? So I was like, how am I going to like still hang out with my friends? Because like, you don't even realize that you, these are your pals and you see them plenty of times throughout the year, but only because you're all traveling and you're doing all the same stuff, right? And um, and so I decided, well, I, and also, you know, just a tremendous amount of like just fear and sadness and negativity and all the like horrible stuff that was happening. I was like, I'm just gonna try to find a way to like put some positivity out there. And meanwhile, like hang out with my friends on Zoom. <laughs> and so I mean, of course it was me and Karen, it was Karen first, right? Karen Slaughter, who's like, you know, one of my besties. And I was on her, she was doing a bunch of fun videos and she had me on. And so then I started doing my videos and I had her on. <laughs> <laughs> and then everybody and it's completely random it's the most bizarre like it's there's no rhyme or reason to it whatsoever it's like anybody who i find interesting i might send a note people have written to me saying can i come on your show i'm like definitely and then i've had re i've had readers <laughs> uh, write to me and go can you invite so mark edwards who's in the uk my one of my long time readers was like um oh can you invite mark edwards to come on your show i was like Sure. So I've never met Mark at all, but he did follow me on Twitter and I was also following him. So I thought, well, yeah, so I'll just send him a note. And he was like, definitely. He came on and like made a cocktail. And so I've just been doing this, you know, um, a couple times a week, you know, just recording and, and, and saving stuff and putting it, you know, putting it out there and just doing book recommendations. You know, what are you reading? What do you love? <laughs> You know, what's your favorite television um, or uh, movie, you know, long time or just, you know, right now it's really transporting you. And then like favorite comfort food or like go-to recipe, because I figured this is every, this is, this is thing, these are the things that we need right now. <laughs> we need to read books and we need to eat and we need to watch TV. That's exactly <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And you know what? This is the other thing I've got too. We started doing this thing called Bookachino Live, where I only talk about books coming out in the next four weeks. Yeah. Because really, you only want to know what's for dinner. Like if, if you, right. you don't sit there and say, what are we going to have for dinner on Saturday, on Tuesday? You say, what are going to have for dinner tonight? And every once in a while, my husband goes, what do you want tomorrow night? And I'm like, oh, so far away. Like, oh, can't do tomorrow night. We have to stick on yeah, tonight. Tonight. 
Yeah. And what can you read? And a lot of times people are saying, let's go pre-order the books right now. And I'm like, how do we just go buy what's in the store? Right. Why don't we just yeah, go let's, yeah, let's buy what's in the store and then pre-order later or buy when it's in the store later. Yeah, that's because for sure. It's like really everybody, there's stuff coming out. And we started doing this with readers because we realized people can't get to the bookstore. And we right. realized that if we just told people we're out in the next four weeks, it's like, it's that little window. It's like right ahead. So we did your book because it was on the 6th. We did it in the middle of September. And then last week, people, if you really want to hear a fun story, which I'm not going to disclose here, you have to go listen. I was on with the people from Goodreads last week and we were having a conversation about this book. And I told the story about you and I from our past oh. at my house. And <laughs> I'm not giving any more away. You have to go listen to the interview with them. I'm going to you. One of the funniest things that has happened. So <laughs> there are these little things that, so I feel like we're laying these little layers because I first talked about the book that it's, you know, coming here. It's, it's, you know, in October, but I talked about it in August because there are five that were long range. So you do this a number of times because this is what's not happening now is people are not going to the bookstore and seeing it on the table. They're not going yeah. to the library. So Bookachino Live is my chance to just go out and tell people that this is what's going yeah. on. That's great. That's great. And you're, you've always been such a huge, you know, part of, of, of the community and such a huge supporter of readers and writers and books. And it's just, it's amazing. You've done such an amazing, um, such amazing things with your career, really. It's, it's been awesome. so much fun because you've watched people's careers grow at the same time. To think about you coming to business in our office on 57th Street with the yep. store, with talking about this fairly first book and now see what's going on. And we had a conversation oh, a couple of weeks in or months or whatever into the pandemic. And yeah. it was nice to just be able to catch up like that yeah. as yep. opposed to seeing each other on the fly at a conference. And exactly. what I find is there are a lot more meaningful conversations happening now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think that's kind of a nice thing about this moment in general. There are all these, you know, obviously it's an incredibly dark time and I would never want to minimize that, um, but I think that there are some silver linings, especially in the way we're the way we're connecting, or the way people have you know started to connect, or reaching out to connect in a time when we're all very disconnected, mm -hmm. and that the time that we're spending with each other, even if it's just virtually, is you know is is a is, is a, of a very high quality. And yeah. I've had a lot of really great conversations with people. Um, you know, about, you know, about everything. Cause when you're talking about books, you're talking about life. When you're talking about food, you're talking about life. That's why there are so many book groups and like, you know, eat and read groups and stuff like that. It's like, when you're talking about story and you're talking about food, you're talking about, you know, family and culture and ideas and identity and all of that stuff. And so I think when you're, you know, there's just so many layers to the things that we can discuss now we have the, we have the time. Time. Yeah. And yeah. every once in a while, I'll pick up the phone and I'll call somebody in publishing on the business side or whatever that yeah. I really don't usually talk to. And I'll say, you know, are you free? And I picked up the phone and called somebody yesterday. I had this wonderful conversation that it would have required me going to lunch, leaving my right. office, like all those things that I really don't have time for. Right. I mean, I really have time for a conversation. And there are many times I've been doing author events in the evening. And it's really nice because then I can go down and have dinner. Yeah. And I have to take the subway back to my car and go home. So I'm doing a lot more, you know, as right. a result because of that. Exactly. I feel the same. Yeah, for sure. It's just like, you know, just really, really wonderful to be able to do that. But I also find that, you know, some of the connections are, it is more real. It is more real about what's going on because people are admitting fear or they're admitting yeah. uncertainty or yeah. like, is school ever going to happen again? Or, you know, things like this. And it's just such a shakeup of everybody's lives. We couldn't have predicted it, but it's brought some very interesting moments together. But like even that connection with readers, you know? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I, feel, I find that as well. Like we're just getting a lot of, you know, connection with my readers. And then also, you know, like, I know people have been saying, you know, like, oh, it's so difficult to promote during the pandemic. And, you know, I, I actually don't have any of those feelings. You know, I feel like in a way, people who have never been able to come to a book signing for a whole host of reasons are now able to connect with me online and they're able to come to all of these different events. And, you know, I'm able to give of myself to them in a way that I, I haven't been able to, like, you, you know, I'm a physical person, right? You can only move me to so many places in, a, in any given week. And so there might be some places where I would never visit, you know, and now I can in this way and that, you know, I can still connect with 
the stores that I love and, you know, promote them in a way that I, you know, what wasn't really able to do like with a physical event, you can only bring so many physical people into a store at a given time. And sometimes, you know, we all know from book signings, you, you know, you go there and there might be 50 people and you could go there and there might be five people and there's everything is like, you know, dependent upon the weather or, you know, there's a local game or there's an election or like whatever, you know, but now it's really different because people can just, you know, they can just click on from wherever they are and, you know, tune in for as much as they can or want to, and then, you know, go back to, you know, all the other stuff that we were just talking about, like, you know, it's mom and work and dinner and all of that. Like, I think this is a way that people can, you know, do things that they have never um, been able to do before. And you know, we always saw authors because our office was in New York. We always saw people when they came through, yeah. but often you'd come through for a marketing meeting. You wouldn't come in through tour. Right. So it wasn't connected a time around the time. And what we're really loving about this is we're able to catch people on pub day yeah. because your pub day might've been in Florida. It might've right. been someplace else, but now we have that opportunity. And right. I also think that um, people are getting to know the authors a lot better because mm -hmm. You usually had a scripted talk. I mean, let's get real, that most people are giving because they're talking about the book. It's a set amount of time, blah, blah, blah. Now it's not. There are many different, you can listen to an offer many different times and learn more. And I think yeah. that's wonderful too. Yeah. I mean, you're in my office. I mean, this is... <laughs> Look at this. You're in my dining room. <laughs> you saw my dog. My dog turned on the TV. <laughs> very smart dog. A very bright dog, you know? So this is your 18th book or 19th? I'm trying to remember. 18th. 18th. Okay. So are you working on 19 now or is it? Yeah, 19 is, is done. It's, um, I mean, well, I'm um, doing edits, doing editorial work on it right now. So it's close to being, you know, done and um, it'll be out around the same time next year. Um, I don't usually talk about it. I don't, no, that's I fine. I can't. I, I never ask. I never I ask. Even, I don't even know. I don't even know. I only just now know what this book is about. <laughs> I read it again last night and I realized, <laughs> meaning you did, I read it again. I'm like, oh, that's what the book's about. You know, it's hard also because you've written the book so far in advance. We do a lot of work with authors. We build websites. I do consulting with them. And a lot of times they're saying, write everything about the book now because you're not going to want to go back to that journey to Amish land or whatever right. it was again, because you're going to be on the next book. You're going to be in Paris. And right. then people are going to ask you questions. You're going to be like, wait, 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 what were the, what are the Amish people, what did they do then? <laughs> really yeah, I've also written a bunch of short stories this year. I had a, a letter B came out on, um, on Amazon this year. And um, also I wrote a, a book for uh, Tampa Bay Noir, I'm a, a story for Tampa Bay Noir, and that came out this year. So I've been reading, writing a lot of short stories as well. So it was a long time ago that I wrote Confessions on the- Yeah, on it was, the what board. time was that train? Oh yeah. yeah was, so, oh, so yeah the, that's I right. Know, so. <laughs> What time was she on that train? 745. And you know what? I always thought it was the morning too. I didn't think it was the night train. That's oh yeah. The thing. Right okay. from the beginning, I thought it was the morning train. Or so, you know, there, do you talk to book groups? Do a book or do you, is that something that happens with a lot with you? Yeah, I do. I do a lot of book group conversations. And in fact, we, um, we have a really exciting one coming up um, from with my local bookstore, Tombolo, which is like one of the, is a brand new uh, local indie in St. Pete, and they're right now shipping books for um, a uh, a big book group discussion for Confessions on the 745, which will happen on November 5th, virtually. So yeah, so I, I'm going to be doing that with them, and I, I do a lot of visits with, um, with book groups. It used to be in their living room, now via now via Zoom. Via Zoom in your office. In my office. Yeah. And they can find you on your website to be able yes. to connect, to be able to do that. Yes. So. Absolutely. Now, are there always stores in the drawer? Like, is there always something, or are you just in the moment of what you're working on right now? Like, 19's done. I for would, there's always there's always some there's always something else going on for me. Always. I always have either a short story or I'm already sort of obsessed with something that's gonna um, find its way onto the page. So, um, yeah, I'll, always. Always something going on. Do you listen to audio? Do you listen to, are you an audio listener? I, I don't, I don't, not because I don't like it, but just because I don't have those blocks of time. I don't have like a commute or drive. I tend to listen to when I'm on the, you know, when I'm working out, I tend to listen to podcasts. I mm -hmm. kind of, mm -hmm. you know, like that time, but I don't have, I haven't done a lot of audio fiction. 
mm -hmm. for some reason. It was funny because we were doing a lot. I was doing a lot more when I was commuting. And yeah. there was a book that I was reading in March. Um, it was the Greer Hendricks, Sarah Pekinen book. Oh, and yeah. I got that. in the car in June and just going to the city, we're moving out of the office. And my son turns around, he goes, whoa, she didn't get out of that situation yet. He goes, it's been months. And I was like, yes, we haven't been in the car. I remember yeah. that. You left her there in that you mess. Left her there. Left her there. Yeah, because like my car is old enough that you can still use discs. And yeah. Car. Like the new cars don't have that. Mine is old enough that I can do that. So I had the disc and I was like, wait, where's the rest of these? So I can finish the story. It was very funny. Very, very funny. That's hilarious. Well, as always, it's wonderful to see you. And Great. we must schedule another date to just chit chat amongst ourselves. I know. Ourselves. We just need to have like a regular, we need to have just like a regular like coffee date. Yes. Or like dishing kind of moment. Yeah. Well, coffee. Coffee. Yeah. People, that's a hint. That's yeah. a hint to the story that's on the Goodreads video. So <laughs> okay. it's a hint. <laughs> for you. So, <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Meanwhile, thank you so much for joining us. It's always been a pleasure from right from the way back in the beginning, you know, you. Uh, let's see, 14 years later, neither of us aged. No, and it's, it's not a really single day. It's amazing. Thanks for joining us. And to thanks. our readers, look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. Thanks for everything.